Hi, and welcome to chapter one, the role of financial manager. So the first place we're gonna start is what is finance? Now finance is basically managing money. And you can do that in, it can be expressed in a personal financial management, it can be expressed in investment management, it can be expressed in corporate financial management. And what we're looking to do is use the tools available today to make decisions about the best way to deploy capital and money. So at a personal level, what we're concerned with uh, is our money as far as how much are we earning versus what are we spending and what are we saving and how are we investing that money. So on a personal level, you everybody can relate to finance as far as the money coming into you, how you're spending it, what you're saving, and your future prospects. Now, in a business context, finance involves much more. So a big part of financial business would be raising money from investors for corporations and how how a corporation is going to take that capital a lot of times in finance we say money or capital sort of interchangeable capital is the money companies have that they can invest so a lot of finances where should they invest the money in an attempt for companies to make a profit and how should firms decide where to reinvest the profits they made or maybe give it back to investors in form of a dividend Okay, so in finance, and this is something particularly important to a lot of college students, is the job opportunities. So there are a lot of career opportunities in finance and financial services. Now, financial services, you can think of it as an area of um, advice on financial products and advice either to individuals, businesses, or governments. So we're, we're looking for a way to for financial professionals who have experience to go into uh, different organizations and help them to manage their money. So this could lead to jobs in banking, uh, personal financial planning, investments, real estate, and insurance. So all five of these areas regularly and routinely hire a lot of finance majors and concentration people to um, help the design and delivery of advice on financial matters. Now, the other, another big career opportunity, and this is the area where I work, is financial management. So financial management is concerned with the duties of um, a financial person within a business. So financial managers are going to look to um, organize, develop strategy uh, for all types of businesses, whether it's private or public, small, large. They all have a financial person who's going to help develop um, a plan or a budget look to um, make the best investments possible for the company, uh, manage risk, um, think about credit management, evaluate uh, the advantages and disadvantages of large purchases, and raise money for the firm's operation. So financial managers are, have many roles when, inside of a corporation, and corporations can have many financial managers depending on the size of the corporation. And these are the people that really keep the business humming and keep, keep the business growing and maximizing profits. Now, um, so the financial managers become even more critical as global, different global crises arise different government regulations change, increase in global competition due to uh, new trade agreements, uh, rapid changes in technologies. It all makes the financial manager's life a lot more difficult. So at, when we say globalization, we're, we're talking about the world trading more and things becoming more competitive between nations and companies really competing across many nations across the world. And that's extra demand for financial experts who have to manage uh, currencies and different cash flows coming from different countries and the tax uh, implications of bringing those profits home or keeping them overseas and the risks that arise from all these international transactions and currencies. So uh, working as a financial manager in a company that has a lot of foreign exchange uh, work or current or issues is even you know a further complexity onto this field. Now as far as being credentially known or having a credential that really cites you as someone who's knowledgeable besides your experience there are different professional certif certifications in finance the chartered financial analyst is probably the most important and the strongest credential to have 
It's similar to a CPA for accounting. So they're both sort of on that same very high quality level. In fact, the CFA is a little bit harder to get than the CPA. And the, the CFA Institute is the one that offers this program. And it's a graduate level uh, course uh, studying primarily on the investment side of finance. So the certified financial analyst, that's probably best utilized by people who are gonna work in investment banks, in the investment industry, uh, now, there's also a certified treasury professional. Well, this would be more for people who are going to work in corporations. And this is a single test where the CFA is a three tests and a certain amount of maybe 48 months of work experience is required. But the CTP is just one test to pass, and that would give you an instant credential to work in the treasury department of a company. And there's also a certified financial planner, which um, is another exam that would make you give you a credential in the area of giving people personal financial advice. So these are three different credentials that you can obtain after graduation to help uh, strengthen your resume and strengthen your earning potential. Now, uh, professional certifications in finance, there is the, the American Academy of Financial Management, uh, and th this they, they administer a certification, uh, in including Chartered Portfolio Manager, Chartered Asset Manager, Certified Risk Analyst, Certified Cost Accountant, Certified Credit Analyst. Uh, and there's also the Professional Certification in Accounting, and that would be my jar, uh, the CPA is the big one there. So finance and accounting are closely related, but if you want a CPA, you really should be in an accounting major. Uh, otherwise, uh, the other financial certifications or charters I mentioned would be something interesting to pursue if you wanted to advance. A lot of times you graduate college, you start working in finance and you want to pursue, you, you want to uh, jumpstart your career and, and pursue other more profitable avenues. So once you start laying the groundwork for the basic experience working in finance, then you can start adding the, the certifications and charters to really amp up your marketability in the field. Okay, so let's switch away from, from the general um, basics of financial management into legal forms of business. So this is sort of the first hurdle that many businesses um, have to decide. What's the right business form to take? And the financial manager, someone could help them decide this. And there are three basic legal entities, sole proprietorship, partnership, and corporation. Sole proprietorship, um, this is a business owned by one person. It's the easiest thing to start up and you're operating it for your own profit. A partnership is when two or more people work together to try and make a, uh, make a profit. And a corporation is an entity that's created by law and basically creating an artificial person to ha that's gonna have the same legal powers as the person, but it's an artificial person. Um, and the benefit of this is that they can, this corporation can live forever, where a partnership or sole proprietorship will die upon the death of a person a corporation can live forever because you're really sort of creating an artificial person to represent the corporation um, and acquire assets and profit and property in the corporation's name so let's look at the strengths and weaknesses of these three scenarios okay so the sole proprietorship the strength of it is that the owner receives all profits um, you don't have to share them with anybody, which is a great thing. There's low organizational costs. It's very easy to set up and maintain. Uh, the income is included on your, your tax return as personal return or income. Uh, you have a lot of independence and secrecy, and you can close the business down whenever you want. On the weakness side of sole proprietorship, uh, you have unlimited liability. If someone sues you, they can go after your business and your personal assets. Uh, you have a limited amount of ability to raise um, funds for your business because it's all based on your financial strength as a person um, as as a sole proprietor you have to do everything uh, and you know it's gonna lack any type of continuity as far as when uh, when you die the business dies with you now a partnership uh, the be benefits of the partnership or strength of the partnership is that you could raise more funds with than a sole proprietorship because now you have two or more people that can all group together their money. Um, so you can borrow more, more money based on the, the amount of owners. The more owners, more likely the more money you can get. There's more brain power, managerial skills because you have more people working together. Uh, and the income is still included on your personal income tax returns. So there's no double taxation. 
the dis the, the the weakness is owners have uh, still have an unlimited liability like a sole partnership. So you could be sued to cover the debts of other partners, and you know you're really getting tied to these people in a financial sense that you know anything happens to the company or if any of them make a mistake, you may wind up paying for it. The partnership dissolves when one of the partners die, and it's and it can be difficult to uh, liquidate or transfer part ownership in the partnership. Now, because of these basic problems, they created a corporation. In a corporation, there is a, the huge benefit of limited liability, which means you can only lose uh, what you invest in the company. So if the corporation sued, they can extend that beyond the corporation to your personal assets, which is great. Um, you can achieve a, a large size because you can sell stock in, in a corporation to many different investors. You can raise a lot of funds relatively quickly. And ownership is transferable easily through stock. It has, it has a long lifespan. You can, it can hire professional managers to run the company. Uh, it has better access to financing as a corporation. The big downside is taxes. Generally, taxes are higher with a corporation. And dividends are, first, the company, the corporation will pay tax on their income. And if they pass the income onto the owners through dividends, then, then you as an owner will pay tax again on your personal tax. So the double taxation is a really downside of the corporation. It's definitely much more expensive to set up and maintain and operate. And there's much more government regulation to corporations. And the, the regulations will require to disclose certain financial aspects of the company, so less secrecy. All right. OK, so if we look at this, we see that the number of sole proprietorships are 23 million versus 3 million partnerships in seven, almost 8 million corporations. So the percentage is 60% partnership, uh, sole proprietorships, 8% partnerships, and 20% corpor corporations. But if you look at the total amount of sales receipts in billions, corporations have 50 billion versus four for partnerships and one for um, sole proprietorships. So you can see that as far as the money coming in, corporations are what's making most of the money. So a, a lot of sole proprietorships are small businesses like, a, a think of a retail store, a, a, a liquor store or a laundromat, uh, things like that. And partnerships tend to be a little bit bigger companies, maybe construction company or real estate company. And then corporations tend to be much bigger companies, uh, hence all the money they make. Now let's look at a, 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 just a, a general corporate structure. So here you'll see the top, uh, the, the stakeholder, the, the stockholders. So the stockholders own the company and they elect the board of directors and the board of directors will turn around and hire a president. And the president um, will hire vice presidents working sometimes with the board of directors, but the president of the company, some call, sometimes called the CEO, would want to have a vice president of human resources to manage the employees. They would want to have a vice president of manufacturing to manage the operations. A vice president of finance, which I think is one of the key roles, the vice president of marketing, and of course the vice president of information technologies. Now the vice president of finance, the CFO, they generally have two big managers working for them, the treasurer and the controller. Now the controller is more sort of on the accounting side. So the controller is going to manage the taxes, the cost accounting, the corporate accounting, and the financial accounting. So the controller is more accounting oriented. The treasurer is more cash management, investment, uh, investment and risk oriented. So the, the treasurer is going to manage credit and capital and foreign exchange and cash, pension funds, um, fundraising. So the, and the treasurer, will, generally the controller and the treasurer will hire managers in each of these areas that they control to help them to uh, do the work and report back to them. So this is the overall financial corporate structure of most large corporations. The smaller the corporation, the more double duty that some managers may do. So you may have a treasurer doing a lot of doing all six of these areas himself in a very small company and the controller. Um, maybe working with instead of working with 30 accountants for a large company they may be working with three so it all depends on the size dictates how many people can hire to help in these areas okay so let's talk about career opportunities in financial management now you could be a financial analyst and this is where people you know prepares the firm's financial plans and budgets 
uh, thinks about strategy and, and financial uh, um, possibilities for the company. So they're, they're doing forecasts, doing financial comparisons, and closely working with accounting. The capital expenditure manager, this is someone who's going to look at long-term investments and how the investments do, do sort of a capital budget to see if the investments are really worth it and what's the return to the company. A project financial finance manager arranges financing for different long-term investments and coordinates with consultants, investment banks, and legal counsel. So sort of a project manager, but financial oriented. The cash manager is someone who's gonna control the daily cash balances. The money coming in, the money going out, collecting money, pay payment of money, short-term investments, and coordinating borrowing from local banks. You will have a credit manager who's going to look at the credit policy, evaluating credit applications from customers. Because if you're a business, you're selling to other businesses or to maybe individuals, and you're, you're sometimes, due to market conditions, going to sell them product on credit, meaning that they're not paying you right away. So you have to really control the collection policy, credit evaluations to make sure the company gets paid back. Pension fund manager for, uh, for um, large companies that still have a pension that needs to be managed and the foreign exchange manager is someone who is looking at managing the foreign exchange operations and protecting the firm from exposure of foreign exchange rates so these are all different opportunities in financial management okay so the goal of the firm is to maximize shareholders wealth so uh, and additionally in this class we're going to be using the zoom simulation and in the zoom simulation you're going to be a financial manager and you're going to try to maximize shareholders wealth which means when you when you when we play this financial simulation game you have to make the company profitable so you need to manage um the financial decisions the forecasting, the amount of money spent on marketing, the amount of money spent on operations, how the company pays for all these expenses, and managing the profit margin levels um, at various stages of the company. So the simulation will help sort of put you in the role of financial manager to manage your company to see what it's like to deploy these various issues that I'm talking about in this class. Now, here's a basic decision rules for a manager. Uh, so the financial manager, um, they may make a financial decision and they have to look at what's the risk of this, this, this action and the possible return. And will this increase share price? If yes, accept the, accept the um, decision. If no, reject. So basically, you don't do anything unless it has the potential to increase shareholders value, which means you need to maximize shareholder wealth. And the way to maximize shareholder wealth is to build a company that's going to generate profits. Not necessarily in the short term, but definitely in the long term. It'd be great if it's both short and long term um, to generate profits for owners. You know, so if we look at these two um, investments, right? So we have um, earnings per share from year one, two, and three uh, for, for Rotor, $141.40, which is a total of two dollars and eighty cents and for valve it's sixty cents a dollar and a dollar forty for a total of three dollars so which is a better investment for profit maximization um, and what's going to lead to the highest share price so there's three things we look at the timing is important when are we receiving the funds we want to receive the funds sooner than later because we can do more with it today than we can do with it um, than later and also because the time value of money devalues future money at, at a rate that makes it worth less than current money. Two, profits. Do not, we, um, do not necessarily result in cash flow. So we have to remember that profits and cash flow are two different things that we're going to be discussing a lot in this class and in this chapter. And profit maximization, you know, um, it, it has to account for risk. So if, you know, If you're looking at profit maximization, you have to always look at it from the lens of how is it going to lead to the highest possible share price, because that's how we maximize uh, owners' value is by increasing the share price. And risk, cash flows, and the timing of the receipts are three important areas that will affect share price and also profit maximization, but in different ways. So we're, and we're going to be talking a lot about this in class. What do we, um, 
what is the best um, decision to make in these three areas? Okay, so what is the goal of the firm? And what about the stakeholders? So the stakeholders, we have the shareholders, which are the people who own the company, but the stakeholders are the people who are also involved in the company and have an indirect um, connect, um, I don't want to say indirect, that have another connection to the company besides, you know, being an owner. So such groups as employees, customers, suppliers, creditors, and owners all have a vested stake in the company continuing to do well because these people are connected to the company and understand they make uh, additional money or profits on the success of the company. So the, the, the firm should have um, a, a stakeholder focus that is going to make take action is going to benefit the stakeholders. Uh, so the goal is not to maximize the stakeholders well-being, but to preserve it. So you want to make sure that the company's profit maximization are first, but that the, sta the stakeholders are also represented and taken care of. So you don't want, you don't want any of these people to be mad at you. You want them to work with you as best as possible so you can maximize your results. Um, and this is sort of a social responsibility a company has. So they, they don't do everything possible to make the highest amount of money and screw over their stakeholders. So they have to always keep their stakeholders in mind when they're running the company. Now, business ethics is a huge part of finance now. And we've had big financial ethics problems in investments with in, insider trading, in corporations, with lying and cheating and falsifying um, accounting and financial information. Misrepresenting mis the value of the company. So business ethics are very important to anybody who's going to be working in finance today and in the future. So businesses have to conduct themselves um, in a proper way. And, you know, you don't want to make a violation in the standards of finance. So, you know, you don't want to try to do any creative accounting, or earnings manipulation, misleading financial forecasts insider trading, outright fraud, which is lying, um, excessive executive compensation, which is unfair to stakeholders, um, backdating options, something that was a big problem at Apple, something that Steve Jobs almost got in trouble for. Uh, and it's backdating options as a way of giving executives money for nothing. Bribery, kickbacks, all these things have had their ugly head inside of finance for a long time, but companies now must... Uh, financial managers are now actually being held more directly accountable for when this stuff goes on and can even see jail time as well as to penalties. And there's also a huge amount of negative publicity if your firm is pointed out and doing any of this stuff. And the stocks usually go down quite a bit if the company is involved in these bad ethics. So if we're looking at ethics as far as a company, uh, here are some guidelines from Robert Cook on ethical viability a proposed action. So here you need to think about um, is the action arbitrary or capricious? Um, does the action unfairly single out an individual or group? Does the action affect the, the, the morals or legal rights of any individual or group? Does the action confirm to uh, ex the accepted moral standards of the current day? Are there alternative courses of action that are less likely to cause actual or potential harm. So these are all sort of the framework of thinking about how you can deploy your financial decisions, uh, making sure that they have an ethical side to them. Now, if you are, if your company is on the up and up and your ethics are good, then it reduces litigation and judgment costs. Um, and maintains a positive corporate image that your corporation is squeaky clean. It builds shareholder confidence and gains the loyalty and respect of stakeholders. And this generally has a positive influence on the amount of business the company does, the amount of profits they can make, and the, um, the amount of interest in the stock, in the stock going higher. So it positively affects the share price of the company. Now, if you look at uh, Google, Google is very ethics oriented and they don't want to do any evil or do any harm. So they have this product called Google Glass. And you know, it's a piece of, it's a computer you wear glasses um, that has raised a lot of concerns about privacy. Now, for example, what if you're wearing these in the locker room of the gym and you can actually record video on them? Um, now, Google states the ultimate goal is to develop services that significantly improve the lives of many people as possible. And their corporate motto is to do no evil. 
um, and they want to do the right thing, even if it means losing some short-term profits. Now, their strong ethics of maybe that's the reason their company has grown so quickly. But the Google Glass is, you know, you know, one of the things that they say you could do with them is that they could, you know, almost um, facially recognize someone and give you some history on them, and, and it and can aid in invading other people's privacy. So that's something that they're struggling with with this particular product and question of ethics and what to do about it. Okay. Uh, managerial finance a function. Let's talk about this for a minute. So the size and importance of managerial finance functions depends on the size of the firm. The bigger the firm, um, the more important, the more involved it gets. So in, in small firms, the financial function is generally performed by an accounting department, which will handle a lot of the financial decisions and functions. But as the company grows, they'll break out and have their own finance um, separate department directly linked to the company president and CFO. Okay, so this again is the corporate organization. You can see that you know, if you have a CF, if you're a large enough company, you're going to have a CFO, and they're going to have various managers, uh, starting with the controller and the treasurer, who are going to have various managers beneath them to work, uh, and in these other departments. So as companies companies grow and become bigger and larger, they hire more people, more accountants, more financial people, because you have a lot more to manage and to discuss. Now, man, finance, managerial finance relates closely to economics. So if you're an economics major or have an interest in economics, it helps to know a lot about economics because finance, you know, financial manager has to understand the economic frame, framework as far as the consequences is going to have on the company. So if the economy growing, contracting, this is going to directly related to forecasting for the company. Uh, level of economic activity and economic policy by certain governments is going to directly impact corporations. So financial managers must understand economics and how it can, how economic changes in the economic uh, economics of business are going to affect their corporation to make their company as efficient as possible. Okay, um, the relationship to marginal cost benefit analysis. So here is a basic economic principle that we're going to look at financial decisions should be made based on the added benefits exceeding the added costs. And it, um, look at this following, following example. So this is something that um, this department store is applying for a marginal cost benefit analysis to decide whether to replace a computer. So the idea is the benefits of the, uh, the computer are 10,000 and the benefits of the old computer are 3,000 because the new computer is more efficient. So we're getting a net marginal benefit of 7,000 if we get the new computer because uh, we already have 3,000, but now we're going to have, uh, so we have to look at the difference. Now the cost of the new computer is 8,000. We could sell the old computer for 2,000, so the marginal cost is 6,000. So the net benefit, the 7,000 minus the 6,000 is 1,000. So this is an important concept to understand about the decision making and the economics of um, replacing equipment inside of a corporation. And you'll have a chance to do to try this out in Excel in the Excel spreadsheet homework. Okay, and there's definitely a relationship to an accounting. So I saw this. I see this relationship sort of like accountants are the ones who are doing the laundry. So they get they get all the inputs, the clothes, they wash them, they dry them. They separate and fold and organize them and put the women away in the proper drawers and closets. So accountants are really the ones who are doing the daily housework of finance. So the accounting activities are close, closely related you know, to the financial decisions companies are going to make. So um, the information in the reports and the details that the financial, the, I'm sorry, the accountants put together is interpreted and analyzed by the financial manager to make decisions. So the financial manager can't make decisions unless the, he has an income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow statement as prepared by accountants. Uh, he can't make decisions unless he has information about the costs of the company and the budgets of the company. So the big difference here is the financial people are the strategic people making decisions based on the data and the reports that the accounting people generate and put together. So um, finance people focus on cash flow and focus on investments and focus on growing and maximizing the profits of a company and the best way to do that. Accounting people look at the inputs and the transactions the companies are making to put them, to organize them according to GAAP in, in a the most um, efficient manner to produce the reports necessary to give the financial people to make the decisions. Um, 
So cash flow is really what financial managers are going to manipulate and look at, and accounting will provide this information through the cash flow statement so they can make better decisions about uh, managing the company. So if we look at this, you know, the company has a sales of 100000 and costs of 80000 so, if we, so that would be in the accounting view. If you have sales of 100000 and costs of 80000 your net profit is 20000 But from the finance side, the financial view, if you have yet to collect any of this money, you sold $100,000 of revenue, but no one's paid you yet because you sold it on credit, you still have those costs. Um, so your net cash flow is negative 80000 So from the financial point of view, we're, we're down 80000 but the accounting view is we made 20000 so the financial is more real world. Like we're really saying we're not going to count any cash flow until we've collected the money. Makes sense, right? Now, in a personal financial example, if you're going to do like a little cash flow for yourself, you want to look at the money that you receive versus the money you pay. So you may have some money you receive from um, your payroll. And then you have your rent, your car, utilities, groceries, clothes, eating out, gasoline, or all out cash outflows. You may get some interest on your investments. So if you look at your inflows versus your outflows, uh, you'll see that your your net cash flow is negative two hundred fifteen dollars. So not probably not the best situation. So this is how the, the starting point of making a budget for yourself is really seeing the inflows and outflows of cash. So you know that uh, if this was me, I would figure out a way to lower some of these costs so that I would have a net cash flow that would be in the positive amount that I could eventually save and invest. Now, of course, the relationship to accounting, finance and accounting differ with respect to decision making. So accountants devote their attention to the collection and presentation of financial data. So people like people doing laundry. Financial managers evaluate the accounting statements and develop uh, additional data based on them through analysis that's gonna help to make decisions to assess the associations of risk and returns for the corporation. So really finance people are decision makers, finance people are the risk takers, and they're the ones that really um, make the decisions to grow the companies. Okay, so let's look at other financial, financial activities. So in the balance sheet, we have current assets and fixed assets, current liabilities and long-term funds. So the, the making investment decisions uh, and making financial decisions are based on these quadrants. So if we're making investment decisions, we may, we're may we going to decide what current assets and what fixed assets we want to buy. In making financial decisions, we're going to look at how to best to fund the current liabilities and, and the long-term uh, liabilities through bonds or stocks of this nature. So these are really the, fi the four financial activities. So if you're, if you're dealing with investment decisions or current assets, you're thinking about how much um, inventory should we have, accounts receivable, cash, and fixed assets, we're looking at plants and equipment, current liabilities we're managing, what's our short-term uh, uh, um, uh, bills and obligations, accounts payable would be a big part of it, and long-term funds would be, say, bonds or bank loans. Now, corporate governance is refers to rule of uh, and processes by, um, and laws by which companies are operated, controlled, and regulated by. So corporate governance is really just, you know, are we ma managing the corporation inside of the regulation and laws that are placed upon it? So there are certain rights and responsibilities that corporate corporations have to adhere to um, for their shareholders, like producing an annual report for their board of directors, their officers and their managers and their stakeholders. So all of this, there, there are rules and procedures for making corporate decisions and making them fairly and justly. Uh, and the stru structure of the corporate governance was described in figure 1-1, uh, one, one, which we showed twice already. Okay, so corporate governance and agency issues. So uh, individual versus institutional investors. So in individual investors are people who own very small quantities of shares of stock uh, to meet their own uh, investment, personal investment goals. And they really don't have much of an influence in the corporation because they're just only a small amount of shares. So it's sort of like if you own shares in McDonald's, 10 shares in McDonald's, you can't walk into McDonald's and say, hey, give me free food. I own this company. They're going to laugh at you because you're just an individual investor. But if you're an institutional investor, you know, professional investors such as banks, insurance company, mutual funds, uh, and pension funds who are, who, you know, this is, these are large entities that can own large quantities of stock. 
on behalf of other participants. And this gives them a lot of shares and a lot of voting rights, which makes them a little bit more involved in the company. So unlike the individual investors, the institutional investors can monitor and directly influence the corporate governance of a company and actually in some cases kind of advise or tell them what to do. Now government regulation generally shapes the corporate governance of all firms. The government has a hand in how they want companies to act. Uh, and during recent decades, corporate governance has become an increased intention due to the abuse companies have done uh, and, and the loopholes in the corporate governments. So these corporate scandals have led to a lot of changes in the law because of the criminal activity by corporate offices, officers in the company. So, the, the, so part of the government regulation is to try and um, make the companies more transparent and, more, uh, and, and to act more fairly. Now, the Sorbanes-Oxley Act is a big regulation that came out of 2002, and it establishes an oversight for, for the accounting industry. And in the, in tighten, it tightens regulations, and controls, and toughens penalties, and strengthens accounting to closures, establishes corporate board structure and membership guidance, uh, guidelines and uh, conflicts of interests, uh, mandates disclosure of stock sales, and increases security regulation and authorization an authority on budgets and auditors and investigators. So what basically happened, let's go back to 2000. Companies were lying their asses off and producing all these crappy financial statements that, you know, they were, lack of responsibility was being tied to the financial people producing these reports. And a lot of underhanded of accounting and financial activities occurred to manipulate companies to make them look more profitable than they really were. Now, Enron, Global Crossing, there's a number of companies that got caught doing this with these shadow and tricky accounting tricks and financial um, tricks that got exposed. And the stock market blew up and went down greatly. We had, we had sort of a, a stock market crash and the government got involved and said, okay, this is, this is just crap. We have to, you know, we can't let companies run around lying to shareholders and doing all these tricky things to make their profits look better when they really aren't. So the Surveys Oxley was enacted to fix that. Now, now the agency issue is when, when you're a manager for the company, you have to act in the best interest of the company. So an agency in, uh, issue can come up when you don't act in the best in, interest of the company. So the shareholders of the company, the principals, the people who own the company, elect managers, the agents who act on their behalf. So an agency problem, problem arises when managers place personal financial goals ahead of the goals of the shareholders. So for example, if a manager says, I'm going to choose this oil company to supply uh, the oil home, the heating oil for the, the corporation. Even though it's a higher price, they chose that company because they're going to fill their home tank up for free. Or maybe they choose a certain landscaper to take care of the grounds of the company because that landscaper promised to do their house for free. That's the agency problem. Or maybe you decided to hire your, um, your brother-in-law, which is nepotism, even though they're not the best candidate for the job because you're, that's going to benefit your, your sister uh, and, and you know, that was your motivation, but it's not the best thing fit for the company. And when these, these arise, these agency problems result in agency costs, which is a, a, a loss of shareholders' wealth by, by managers making the wrong decisions. Now, a big, another hot topic in finance is management compensation. So you've heard in the news about how all these um, big executives make huge money, and that's, that's something that's closely being looked at. But you have to motivate these people to want to make the company better. So management compensation plans is a way to try and do that. Um, and it's ensuring that managers' interests are aligned with the shareholders' interests. So a lot of times these compensation plans are tied to the performance of the company. And they compensate along with in, in how well the companies perform. And so this is why sometimes managers get these, some, these incentive plans sometimes work too well because managers will do whatever it takes to increase the short-term profits of the company so they make their bonuses. And that's not always the best interest. So a lot of this uh, new focus is on more longer-term incentives. So an incentive plan, the manager compensates uh, managers um, by granting them stock options. The idea is that if you're a manager and you have stock in the company, you're going to want to do what's right to increase the stock price because you're personally going to benefit from it. There's also performance plans, which hires management compensation to the growth um, of earnings per share, um, 
the performance of shares or cash bonuses as compensation under these plans. So if, the, if certain metrics perform well, then the management gets bonuses. So performance could be, it could be based on pro, um, profit margins, return to equity, return on assets, earnings per share, things like that. So let's look at some corporations and you can see that compensation, you know, almost a hundred million for Oracle, uh, all the way down to 20 million for Qualcomm. So you can see that these, these executives CEO pay is quite tremendous. Even though when stock markets may not return a lot of money, they're still being very generously compensated. And a lot of people feel that, feel that it's unfair that the top people of the corporation make so much while the people at the very bottom make so, so little. Okay, so if we're talking about the agency issue and the threat of a takeover, when the firm, um, the firm's internal corporate governance structure uh, is unable to keep agency problems in check, it's likely that a rival manager will try to gain control of the firm. And, uh, and, the, and the threat of a takeover by another firm, uh, which believes that it can enhance um, the trouble company's value by restructuring its management and, uh, and weeding out the, the um, agency issues and putting them under their management operations and financing structure um, and their enhanced corporate governance. So sometimes if there's big agency issues in the company, that enhances a takeover threat uh, of the company as the company is weakened significantly and it opens up the avenue for somebody else to come in and take over where shareholders will be gladly could see this as a savior to the company and gladly go along. Okay, so that's it for chapter one of finance. And we've done a lot. We, we've defined the ma um, finance and the managerial function. We've talked about the legal forms of business. We looked at the goal of the firm and explained why maximizing the value of the firm is, you know, is an appropriate goal for the business. Described the managerial uh, finance function related to economics and accounting. The five, we also identified primarily activities of the financial manager. And we described the nature of the, the principal agent relationship within the um, course. Now remember that um, you need to go and look at my finance lab. There are a bunch of exercises and homeworks there to complete. You should also go to Blackboard and look under assignments to complete the um, spreadsheet exercise for chapter one. I also have a self-help video there. And also you need to start thinking about and running some practice rounds for the Zoom simulation. Thank you for your time and we'll be talking soon. Take care.